need a comforter. The good news is you got one. He's right there. You've enthroned him in your heart. And that restoration process of restoring you to wholeness every day, that's what Jesus is talking about. And depending on your condition and what you went out to see, you either are going to receive that and get a hold of it, or you're not. There's something else you want. If there's something else you want, you pretty much have come to the wrong place because what I'm offering you is a different type of restoration. In Malachi, the fourth chapter is the last chapter of the, of the Old Testament, verses 5 and 6. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. What an awful way to end the Old Testament with the word curse, considering how we started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. It was good. It was, it was very good. And by the time we get to the other end, the last word is curse. Because something of extreme importance needs to take place. The restoration, the restoration of the hearts of the fathers to the sons, the sons to the fathers. That Luke 1, verses 13 through 18. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So it's not hard to see the connection between the Malachi prophecy, the Aunt Gabriel telling Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, guess what? Your son is Elijah. He's going to be the fulfillment of what was talking about. He's going to be the messenger before the Messiah. Same message of restoration. Now, talking about this restoration of relationship between the fathers and the sons, sons and the fathers, looking at that restoration, we're looking at it on two levels. Whenever we read the Bible, we should always be looking on two levels. We should be looking on one level that becomes natural. It is what you read. An angel visited Zechariah. That happened. That's very, this is the story, this is the history. But then there's a spiritual message. So when we're looking at the restoration of fathers and sons, there's two levels that we're actually looking at. We're looking at the restoration of all of us in this room, of all of mankind, to our Heavenly Father. We either believe or we don't that our children are exactly what the Bible says and what God says. He gave them to us. They came from Him. You know, I tell people a lot of times, there's not a lot of things I can really say I really, really know, but that's one of them. No doubt in my mind. Don't ask me to figure out how that happens sometimes. There's a, a lot of strange ways that that happens. But these kids, every child on this planet was given from God. There's the two levels. There's the Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus said, No man comes to their Father except through me. And that doesn't mean no man comes to God. I hope you realize that. What, he, what Jesus is saying is no man can come into the father-son relationship with God. They'll never get it unless they come through me. You're not going to get to your heavenly father except through me, which means you can have views on God and all-powerful. I mean, let's face it, there's tons of religions on the planet. We know that, right? And they work at coming into this relationship with, with God. Bless them all. I mean it. God bless them all. But the thing that we need most is to know God as our Father. And you don't get into that relationship without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do we get that kind of thing? That the relationship that God wants with us is as a father to his children, and that only comes through Jesus. Jesus was always talking about the restoration of that relationship. I can't imagine how he doesn't appear to be all that frustrated but, you know, it's all, I can't imagine the level of frustration of preaching a message of restoration and they're looking for a ruler. Are we going to beat up the Romans tomorrow? When are you going to establish your kingdom? When do we get to beat up the Romans? I'm all set. When do I get to win? I've been losing a long time. 
He's talking restoration with God as your father, that he loves you. Yeah, 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 that's good. When do we get to beat up Romans? Well, actually, I want you to love your enemies. That ain't happening. And there's no sense getting on their case, because I know a lot of Christians that if I ask them to really fess up, really, really fess up, how do you feel about Muslims? We're not much different than the Jews in that respect. And this is what Jesus was trying to say, that we've got to get beyond this conquering crusade mentality. We got it, you don't. What Jesus is talking about is this restoration that takes place, a move of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that floods us with love for everyone. And we're actually finally able to die to religion for crying out loud and not want to kill people, but want to bring a message of restoration to their lives that your Heavenly Father is longing to have a relationship. You know that anger that you've got and that killing spirit that you want to kill everybody? <laughs> that's, that's not your Heavenly Father. That's not God. And He wants to help walk you through that. Not so you can be like me, so you can be like Him. You've been sold something that's not true. Jesus constantly is referring to his Father. Over a hundred times, if you've seen me, it always amazes me when I, when I talk to people and say, you know, I just, I don't know, really, you know, God the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. All the words that I speak, they're not my words. The Father gave, I mean, to me, getting to know the Father is a very, very, Simple thing, because Jesus is the Father embodied. What is there confusing? I'll tell you what confuses people. That in the Old Testament, it looks like God is wiping people out left and right. For those who have ears to hear, you can hear it. Maybe there's some miscues and misrepresentation of God that Jesus actually came to sort out. Now I get people who want to kill me because I'm touching the Bible. I don't give a rip. Because what I care about more is everybody coming to a place of being restored in their Heavenly Father and knowing the Father's love, acceptance, grace, mercy. And I'll tell you what, after that, the difference between the written Word and the Word of God becomes quite clear. And the message of restoration screams off the page that only comes through the Spirit of Elijah, the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's message. And Jesus testifies to it. The works and the words, they're not mine, they're my Father. At the Last Supper, it says in John 13, 1, Jesus knew it was the end, and he knew that he was returning to the place that he came from. And it's not heaven. It doesn't say he was returning to heaven. He says he was returning to his Father. He came from the bosom of the Father, and that's what he was returning to. And he's telling all of us here, I know you have heaven fixations, I get it. You know, heaven is in your mind all the time. Maybe if you replace that with the Father, I'm going to be returning to my Father. Streets of gold, who needs it? That's the whole point of streets of gold. We do know that, right? It's to say, you know, the thing that you cherish the most on earth is gold. It'll be as helpful as the streets you walk on in heaven. But who do I behold? John says, look, I saw one. And I saw him sitting on this throne. Well, who made the throne? Who gave him the throne? I can, I can really get off on all this, believe me. In terms of all the things that we've been given to reach our ruler, empire, kingdom mentality that God has been so good to help us with just so we can get to know him. You want a throne? Yeah, I got a throne for you. Great. Now we got a throne. Because we're so throne mindset instead of love mindset. The cross, if we only see atonement, when we become so atonement fixed, it's really hard to catch the message of restoration with the Father and the Son, the spirit of love and peace and joy of all things. It's really hard because we're, we're like in a box of this one particular thing that the cross is about. And the cross has to do with all things. It has to do with so much more. It's so much bigger. If nothing else, we get. But that's all our Father who art in heaven. That's on one level. The other level 
is earthly fathers. The breakdown that Malachi is talking about is a breakdown of humanity with their heavenly father, but there's also been a breakdown on an earthly level of particularly fathers with sons. Now granted, the Jewish religion is very patriarchal. Anyway. It's a little bit tricky. So seeing the breakdown of the responsibility that was given to the fathers to raise their sons, when you look at Genesis, and we don't have time to go through the whole book of Genesis, in Genesis 4, while Cain is killing his brother, where's Adam? I mean, he is their dad, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's working the field like a good dad should, really, while his one brother's killing another, while one of his sons is killing another. But he's out working the field and working the job, because that's what you do. I go to work. Is that what God has called us to do primarily? There's already a breakdown going on. Something is wrong. And when you start to follow that through the breakdown, you get to the point where Jacob loves one son more than the other 11. I'm not presenting a case for Reuben, Levi, the whole bunch of them that had problems. But I'm telling you what, I don't think that this love that was showered on one son helped the other 11. I'm sure you've read this before, but maybe you'll see it differently this morning. Genesis 5, verses 1, 2, 3. This is the book of the generations of Adam, in the day when God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Do you hear what's, what's being said there? What? God made man in his image and likeness. Adam makes his sons in his image and likeness, in and Adam's Adam. image and likeness. Well, it's the same thing we all do. Right here is sitting a product of you two, as much of God, but as much of you two. And if you don't see that, I'll bring my kids in, and we'll, we'll look at them for a while. And you'll see that they're a lot in my Steve's image and likeness.